Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Thank you for all morning, of you. Good morning, Sister Colleen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Thank you, Sister Gladys. Uh, we'll pray before we get started, and then we'll start our lesson study. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your courts today. As we open your word, as we study, open our hearts, Lord, to receive your word. May your angels be present among us, that our hearts may be lifted up to you. We thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's take a look at our lesson, which is let brotherly love continue. We've come to the end of our quarter, and Paul concludes this quarter with the fact that we need brotherly love. We're encouraged to have brotherly love. So let brotherly love continue. When he looks at the relationship of the household of God, he looks at it from the fact that we're not just individuals who are all in our own way uh, striving for eternity, but he looks at it also in the fact that as a congregation of people, we're striving for eternity. And the hope and the prayer is that together we help each other get there. Not that we we, we're responsible, in a way we are responsible uh, for those around us, because we need to, in our lives and in our words, be an encouragement to the brethren, be those who support and help the brethren in their walk, because this is a challenging walk. You know, there are people who uh, tell themselves, before I was a Christian, things seemed to be going fine for me, but since I've taken on this path, there are so many challenges. There are challenges. Uh, there are challenges in this present church. There were challenges in Paul's time. There were challenges when Christ had his disciples because that's human nature. And that challenge for striving by God's grace is, will always be with us to the end of time. But the encouragement here is that as we love each other, we help each other along that Christian pathway. Yes? Can I just add something? Sure. <laughs> I think once you give your life over to Christ, it seems like it's more of a challenge because Satan is really on your case at that time. Because when before you were a Christian, you was just doing the things that the enemy would, you know, have us do. Or I, I may not be saying it correctly, no. but once we come to Christ all the more he'll try to interfere in our life with Christ. Okay, yes. I guess when we're out there doing what he wants us to do, there is no issue. But once we take on another role, once we turn around and go the other direction, then there's a tremendous challenge. So in Hebrews, and I'm gonna read it again, one tells us, let brotherly love continue. but. Uh, verse 2 tells us, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Uh, and a lot of times when we talk about that verse, one of the things we remember is we remember Abraham. I don't know if we have any pictures. I think I have my pictures. The first one is with what? Okay. 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 It doesn't matter. I, we'll, we'll work around it. Um, be not for, you know, we, we talk about that a lot of times and we think of Abraham because of the fact that Abraham, when he saw three strangers, bowed to them and brought them into his tent and fed them, called for a lamb to be killed and roasted and food to be made for them and entertained them. And I think of us in this modern time in terms of strangers. 
I tell you, first of all, we're suspicious of everybody, most of us anyway, um, suspicious of people we don't know, and the fact of entertaining strangers is very daunting um, because there is so much distrust and there is so much caution in the world that we currently live in. So we're very careful, and that has to be so. But we also want to be encouraged. Don't let the fact that we're so very careful sort of close our hearts and make our hearts hard so that we don't look around and see the need of those around us. We want to remember also on the Sunday's lesson, Paul, a bit. I think I have a picture there. Um, yes. So Paul, we remember um, when he was converted, now came in contact with so many of the brethren. And we remember also the fact that at the beginning of his ministry, were they welcoming of Paul? Certainly not. They, were, they had heard of Paul. They were afraid of Paul, and they were skeptical as to whether Paul had actually been converted. But this little picture here shows us that in part of Paul's ministry, he's welcomed into the home of Priscilla and Aquila and, and made a part of that family because they also were tent makers. So the thing about it is they had something in common, okay? They shared that same trade. And this was something that I'm sure helped bind Paul to, to this couple. With Christians, we have something in common. We're all believers in the crucified Lord. We're all believers. And that common thread is something that should bind us together in a very, very special way. As we talk about Sunday, we're also encouraged to remember those who are in prison. We look at ourselves and, you know, if we look at what we've done or haven't done, I think our prison ministry has languished, by the way. Probably currently now, we, we don't have anything in place to serve prisoners. And, you know, I remember years ago uh, speaking to someone who was a minister, and he had had some contact with our system, with the... Um, the jail system, for want of a better word, and who felt that, you know, they're in there, they're all guilty. And I, I remember being very, very offended. <laughs> and I was offended because I remember that same year, and that was a few years ago, that in the state of Texas, they had like 100 plus, maybe like 140 people who had been exonerated based on DNA evidence. And we're talking about people who had been in prison for many, many years. So I'm not saying all of those people incarcerated are innocent, certainly not. But you have a lot of people over the years who've been accused of crimes that they have not committed. And as Christians, we need to be not just sympathetic, but we need to work for a betterment of those in prison. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the fact that if you know Whitney Phipps, Whitney Phipps organization runs a program that services the children of incarcerated people. So this is basically their ministry. But even as we're encouraged to have brotherly love, even as we're encouraged to remember those who are incarcerated, we also take a look at our history. Because yes, we could talk about brotherly love, but I hate to tell you that in our system, within our, among ourselves, we have prejudice, prejudice against people because their income level is not my income level. We have prejudice against people because um, your skin color, we have prejudice against people for a variety of reasons. And I don't have to, uh, I don't have to exaggerate on that because we know it's true. Uh, but I want to give you a part, really, of our actually rich history. Because 
Way back in 1900, Sister White was talking and speaking out against racism against black in the South. And the sad part of it is, even through the years, what we saw, and I'm gonna bring you to that point, is that it still persisted. It still persisted. In 1943, and some of you are familiar with that story, that story of Lucy Baird. Lucy Baird was, uh, she was a black Adventist. She lived out in Long Island, and she was sick. And this was 1943. And so being an Adventist, her aim was to go to an Adventist hospital. And so they took her to Washington Adventist Hospital, 1943, and you and I both know what happened. They couldn't accept her. They attended only, it was a white only hospital. If you came in and you were black, they'd probably put you down in the basement and, and hope somebody sees you after the doctor makes his regular rounds. And this was 1943. We come forward and we see that, you know, prejudice against people is something that's sometimes very, very deeply rooted. And unless we examine ourselves, we're not aware of it. Um, people can give you examples. Sister Marcian went to school probably in the 70s or the 80s, where someone who was a teacher in a school would tell her, when I get to heaven, I'll come over the bridge to hear the darkies sing. So we think to ourselves, you know, we're all fine. No, we're not all fine. Because the aim of it is we need to examine ourselves. We need really and truly to understand what is our relationship with God. But I want to bring us back to something that I thought was very interesting. Because our pioneers, when we read about them at the turn of the century, helped with the Underground Railroad and fought against slavery. And this is something that we're not always aware of, but I want to read a little bit about it just to give you an idea of the sacrifice and the courage that they had. It tells us here, the Second Advent Movement was inseparable from the abolitionist call for the immediate and total destruction of slavery and demand for equal rights for the oppressed. From the rise of the Millerite movement in the early 1830s through the end of the Civil War, Adventists of all varieties used the tactic of moral suasion to warn pro-slavery Americans that God would soon return and judge them if they did not immediately repent and reform in this manner. They made protests against racial injustice inseparable from the Adventist faith. Though many Adventists avoided associations with political parties because they supported slavery, beginning in 1840, a significant number joined the Liberty Party, which had a single platform, the immediate and total abolition of slavery and the restoration of equality of rights among men. In 1848, the Liberty Party nominated Gerrit Smith, a prominent abolitionist, Millerite Adventist, and Seventh-day Adventist observer as a candidate for the United States presidency. Throughout the entire antebellum period, or anti after the war, Millerites and Seventh-day Adventists risked their lives to liberate slaves from bondage. While some this, this, did this legally by purchasing slaves' freedom, Many broke federal law by assisting fugitives on the Underground Railroad. They upheld God's fugitive slave law. Deuteronomy 25, 23, 15, and 16 tells us, Thou shalt not deliver unto his master 
the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee. He shall dwell with thee, even among you, in that place which he shall choose in one of thy gates, where it liketh him best. Thou shalt not oppress him. Indeed, thou shalt not oppress him. So here we see, this is our history. We have a history of what? Of fighting injustice. And this is a history that serves us well. And it's a history that we need to remember. We look in Christ's day at the Jews, prejudice against Samaritans. And we like to say to ourselves, you know what? If I were there, I would be different, da, 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 da. But we come to our time. And it is for each of us to examine how we see each other. How we see each other. Are we truthful? Or in our hearts, do we harbor prejudice simply because someone is different from us? Any questions, comments uh, before we move on? Brother Satya, sure. Thank you, Sister Collins. Couple of observations. You see, you gave the example of the Adventist person who was taken to the Washington Adventist Hospital and she was declined from seeing. Now, remember, our church has come a long way. Before, we used to have a segregated church for the blacks and the whites. So it took quite a while for even the church to accept those non, uh, uh, what would I say, looking people who look different, you know, from your race. Even talk about now, today, in our time, 21st century, we just had the hearing of the Supreme Court judge, Kitanji Brown. Now, she is a qualified person, a Harvard graduate. In fact, she has more experience than four of the current sitting judges. And still, from the other side, basically the white people, they grilled her so badly to ridicule her, even though she is in par with the same people, Harvard graduate, you know, but just because of the color, the segregation, that distinction is still existing. So what do we do? You know, it's a difficult situation. I remember when I was in eighth grade, uh, there was a teacher who told us to read certain books. And there was an article, a book, a story about a man who was very helpful in the community. He would go in his horse, a white horse, a beautiful horse, and he'll go from place to place helping people. And then one day as he was going, a man came up and he says, sir, you have a beautiful horse. Can I take a ride and see how it is? And the man said, sure, have a look. And he got up in the horse and started going around. And then all of a sudden he took off with the horse. And this uh, old man started shouting, wait, 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 I have something to tell you, wait. And so the guy came around, he said, don't tell this incident to anybody or else they will not believe in people helping other people. And with that, that the thief just ran away with the horse. So the lesson is, of course, sometimes we distrust people, as you said, you know, some of us maybe have that experience in our life and we want to make sure that we want to avoid such experience again hitting us. But we as Christians, we have to continue our brotherly love to each other. Now, if I were to ask you, how do you know whether the brotherly love shown to us is a genuine or fake? That is, of course, 
we don't judge people. It is God who is ultimately going to judge. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Sam. Mr. Colleen. Sure. I uh, just would like to add that um, I think I think it's a, it's a sad state of affairs for humanity, but uh, it has a lot to do with ignorance. You know, it's not so much that uh, I know that in some particular instances and uh, cases and areas, it could boil down to, 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 to hatred. But I think by and large, it's a matter of ignorance. If you grew up in a community, an area where there was all folks the same color as you, and suddenly you see another person of another color, you know, it, you don't know how to treat these people because of the lack of exposure. And I really, in my heart, think that that's the case. Because I can tell you, Liza and I have been in many places, not just in this country, but in the whole world. And we would always look for Adventist churches, no matter where we've been, and have been treated beautifully, you know, warmly, in almost all of the places in the world, with only one exception, South Carolina. We joined our brothers and sisters there, and there was hardly anybody who spoke to us. Hardly. One, if not two, but very, you know, reserved, kind of, hey, how are you? Like that. So that gives you an idea of uh, the level of ignorance that people still have, still hold, even in our very own country in terms of racism. Thank you, Brother Ron. Anyone else? Okay, Sister Carol. Yep. I want to say something very basic as far as uh, what we are talking is concerned. And that is uh, our sinful natures. You know, we are born with all these tendencies. We have inherited them. And there's a struggle, you know, to, what to say, tell it frankly, there's a struggle in each one of us. So, I mean, that aspect should not be neglected. And uh, Satan tries to take advantage of that inherited tendencies in us. We have it. We can't deny it. It comes automatically. It's in our blood. It's in our genes. And it's a battle. Thank you, yeah. Brother Nelson. Yeah. Uh, Sister Carol, go ahead. Uh, sometimes, or a lot of times, it's also in the way you're brought up. Because, I mean, I want to, you know, I thank God I was brought up in a non-prejudiced home like that. But you have those, like, I remember telling you that one time I was watching a talk show and you had these people that are in the Ku Klux Klan. Even the baby. And they brought the baby out With in one of those outfits. Yeah. So this poor child is learning this from the day he's born. You know, all his livelihood. And, and it's just like ingrained in them. But I think you also have to come to a certain point in your life where you start realizing like this is not right. Are you done? Thank you. Thank you for Can your Can I say something? I'm driving. Please, Brother Mike. Yeah, personally, we've talked about uh, the history of uh, maybe racism or prejudice. Today, as individuals, when we go around, we drive, we see somebody maybe who is not like us or who is poor, they're homeless. And they are just looking onto us for some help. How do we show love to them? Do we ignore them? Or have we been able to reach out to them because they are someone, uh, uh, they are, uh, uh, he or she is somebody who is in need of our help? Or do we just uh, rationalize, oh, this person is a drunkard, he's an addict, he is this or, or she is that, 
and ignore to render the basic help. Because the lesson is talking about brotherly love. How do we show that love that God demands of us to those people who are very unfortunate? Because it's easy for us to preach it, but how do I put it into practice on a daily basis? That's all I have to say. Thank you, Brother Mike. Thank you all. Uh, I just want to make two more points before we move on. Uh, one of the things, and I, and I like that point, Brother Mike, because very often we forget that Christ died. He didn't just die for one group sitting in Congress Street or another sitting in Montgomery Street. He died for all men. And in the sight of God, all men are equal. We may not like that because sometimes in our hearts we think uh, differently to someone, but in the sight of God, all men are created equal. We have no foothold because um, we're something different. And even as I look at this lesson, I think it helps us to better understand why Christ went through Samaria. Because the Jews, and we like to point to them, looked down on the Samaritans. And there was a barrier there. Even when the, the gentleman um, who needed help, the person who helped him was a Samaritan. The last person you would think, because the Levi passed him by and the priests passed him by without helping him. And so as Christians, I, yes, as Brother Nelson says, inherently we have, we have those, those um, tendencies. We have that to fight against. But let us be encouraged in the fact that our job here is to build Christian character. You can't build when people build physical strength. You build it against a resistance. If the job was easy, you, you, won't, you won't have to do that. But you build physical strength against resistance, against something that you push against. Building your character as Christians falls into the same category. If it was easy, it'd be a piece of cake, as the people say. But it takes work by God's grace to build a character that would suit us for the society of angels. Because that's our end. That's our end that we hope for, the society of angels. And let us remember that even as we look around and sometimes think someone is not quite worthy, that what? That they too have attending angels. Okay? God, Christ died for all men. He didn't say I'm dying for the Jewish man or I'm dying just for any group of, us, of people. He died for all men. Any comments before we move on? Okay, let's move on to, to Monday's lesson. And Monday's lesson, covetousness and sexual immorality. Let's read from Hebrews 13, 4 and 5. And Hebrews 13, 4 and 5 tells us this. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourself also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And so he's tying here the fact marriage is honorable. But they're tying here together um, sexual immorality and covetousness. Let's read also Luke 16, 10 through 18. And Luke 16, 10 through 18 tells us this. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in, in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore 
you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you trust the true riches? If ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourself before men, but God knows your heart. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John, since the time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man press it into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. So he's telling us here, listen, you have to be faithful, okay? You have to be faithful. You can't serve God and you can't serve mammon. And a lot of time that idea of mammon comes in the idea of worldliness or riches. You can't serve both of them. It's interesting that in Monday, covetousness and sexual immorality is sort of tied together. What's the Ten Commandment? What's that? Oh, I keep. So, yep, can we get our gold up there? The next one. All right, thank you. Thank you, Brother Steve. What's the last commandment of the Ten Commandments? Covetousness. And what does that Ten Commandment tell us? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. In general, thou shalt not covet anything that is thy neighbor's. Okay? Because the point about it, as I looked at his title, tells me if you're coveting his house and you're coveting his wife, what are you going to do? It's not your wife. Somebody else's. So that attitude of covetousness sort of covers also that idea of sexual immorality. Now Paul here in Romans, when you read about Paul telling the Christians about what they need to do, I want to bring together, he was trying to tell them, you know, about the marriage, about the marriage and the sacredness of marriage. One of the things we have to realize is what the society at that time was like. And the society in the time of Paul, that Greco-Roman society, was a society that was male-dominated. And when you talk about male-dominated, you're talking about that masculinity that dominates on a battlefield, but also dominates in the home, okay? And things that we frown upon was common practice in Roman society. Pedophilia, which we frown on and, and look on with horror, was something that was practiced. Women were second-class citizens in Roman society. So we have to understand the fact that as Christians came in and as their influence was felt, their whole way of life was entirely opposite to the Roman way of life, to the way of life of the society at that time. So it's like someone coming in with a brand new idea of how to live and challenging, as it were, your idea of what you've done. You've done this. This is your way of life. This is what is accepted in your society. Now here is someone or a group of people coming in and saying, you know what? This is not God's order. God's order is that you should have a man, his wife, and that relationship is respected. So we see, even as we look at that, that to that um, Roman society, 
Christianity was a threat. It was a threat to their whole way of life and their whole way of existing. Paul encourages us, just as we saw, not making mammon your God, to be what? To be content. The defense against vice is an attitude that Paul encourages. First, they should be content with the things that they had. All right? Believers then are invited to respond to God's promise in his word. The Lord is on my side. I will fear not. What can man do? So Paul here is encouraging them to be faithful in their marriage relationship, to be content with what they had, so that covetousness, so that sexual immorality would not have a place among them. And this is a struggle as we look even in the book of Romans that would go on for such a long period of time. Any comments? Before we move on, no comments? Okay, I just want to read for you just one, um, one short paragraph and we'll move on. Um, and the, the writer is saying, do you see Christianity did not simply represent an alternate system of morality, but one that condemned the existing system, the system that was foundational to Roman identity and stability. Christians were outsiders. Christians were traitors. Christians were dangerous. Their brand of morality threatened to destabilize all of society, no wonder then they were scorned and persecuted. Their whole way of life as Christians was vastly different from that existing in the Roman Empire. Okay, we have no comments. We'll move on to Tuesday's lesson. Now, Tuesday's lesson tells us, remember your leaders. Hebrews 13, 7 through 17. Remember your leaders. Can we get that picture on the leadership? Uh, remember your leaders. And remember your leaders uh, is just filled with so much, um, so much irony so much hope, so much of everything. Uh, let's read Hebrew 13, 7 through 17. And Hebrew 13, 7 tells us, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. Considering the end of their conversation, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar, wherefore they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burnt without the camp. I'm not gonna go further than that, but the, uh, we're being exhorted here to remember those who have rule over us. And as we talk about our leaders, uh, one of the things we have to, to keep in mind is the challenges of leadership. And there are many. They have the responsibility of those who are in their flock. And so 
leaders bear a tremendous burden. It is our duty then to pray for them, to lift them up, to remember that when you have elections or the, the process of electing and putting people in place, that we have to remember to pray for them. Because what we want at the helm of the, of the organization is men who are true to God. That's what we want. We want men who are willing to walk in the way that God has pointed out to them. We want people who are obedient to God. Because even as they lead, we have to remember that they too have a leader. You know, I'm going to take some time here uh, just to talk about uh, Sister White. Now, in 2014, the General Conference of the United States or the General Conference of the Church apologized to Sister White. And they apologized to Sister White. I'm going to read that to you. Because in 1891, they had sent Sister White off to Australia. And I want to read... Um, I want to read this letter to you, and it says here, today, over 120 years after sending Ellen White to Australia, the General Conference has issued a formal statement apologizing for what was unequivocally a low move. White was sent as a missionary to Australia after she clashed with General Conference leaders in the early 1890s, while advocating for a number of issues, including a more Christ-centered Adventist theology. This is, not great, this is not great writing, but it says, to say it was uncool for us to send Ellen White to what at the time was little more than an un uncultured den of criminals is a massive understatement, said the GC Director of Human Resources. Let me remind you that a century ago, there was no veggie option at the Outback Steakhouse. There was no Outback Steakhouse for that matter. There was just a massive, dusty Outback down under. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this, because this does have to do with our history. Um, Sister White was sent to Australia in 1891. Now, two things I want to, two points I want to, Hold on. One, Australia. For most of you may know the history of Australia, because Australia was a penal colony. Starting in 1788, the British, the criminals they didn't want in England, were sent to Australia. And this was done until like 1866. It was done for a period of like 80 years. So the time that Sister White went to Australia, which may have been like 30 years after the end of that um, way, the end of Britain sending uh, criminals to Australia, was a time when Australia was un, un, underdeveloped, very underdeveloped. Uh, all its different states were run as separate countries, so this was a very difficult situation. But I want to come to the other point. Why were they sending Sister White to Australia in 1891? Well, I hope we know our history. In 1888, there was a general conference. In that 1888 general conference, two young men, Wagner and Jones, presented a message that the general body of the church did not accept. But Sister White sided with them, knowing and realizing that the message was of God. And her position was that even after that, what she would do is work with them to help them establish the message. Well, by 1891, the General Conference had had enough of Sister White and Wagner and Jones, and the decision was they will send Sister White to Australia, they will send Wagner up to England, and I think I'm not sure what happened to Jones because I know eventually that he did um, work with Dr. Kellogg. And if we know Dr. Kellogg's history, that in itself was not a great history. 
because Dr. Kellogg eventually fell into spiritualism. But I want to read to you a little bit about that history because that's a history that has affected the trage trajectory of the church teaching. And it is something that we need to be aware of. She says here, and this comes out of It comes out of Testimony to Ministers. And what she tells us in Testimony to Ministers is that God had sent, Testimony to Ministers, page 90, a very precious message through Brother Wagner and Jones. And this is why, here's what she says also. When Brother Wagner brought our, uh, out, when Brother Wagner brought our, these ideas in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching about this subject from any human lips I had heard, excepting the conversation between myself and my husband. And so Brother Wagner's message essentially was righteousness by faith. She says further to all those who fought against the message, whether we like to think of it or not, we have to look at ourselves now and say, how much of this message do we know? Have we been exposed to this message? And while there were many who feel that the message has come down and we're generally familiar with it, she says here, stand not in the, in the way of this light. And this was a warning that she gave them. When you read in testimony to ministers, there was warning after warning that she gave them. She says, stand not in the way of this light. If you wait for light to come, in a way that will please everyone, you will wait in vain. If you wait for louder calls or better opportunities, the light will be withdrawn and you will be left in darkness. She says, who of those that acted a part in the meeting at Minneapolis have come to the light and received the rich treasures of truth which the Lord sent them from heaven, not one. God meant that the watchmen should arise and with united voices send forth a decided message. Then the strong, clear light of that other angel who comes down from heaven, having great power, would have filled the earth with his glory. We are years behind. The scenes which took place at this meeting in Minneapolis made the God of heaven ashamed to call those who took part in them his brethren. And this just gives us a little glimpse of that history of what happened in Minneapolis. And most of us don't know, some of us may not have read, but the works that came out of that was just, these two gentlemen did so much work. There are studies in Hebrew by Wagner. There are two studies in Galatian, one by Jones, one by Wagner. There are studies in Roman. I sent several of the brethren uh, uh, um, an argument against Sunday law. That argument against Sunday law was made by Jones before the Congress of the United States. An argument so broad, so comprehensive, that it could only be from God. We have been given that. What use, what have we made of it? So many of us, and I'm, this is not a criticism, but this is an encouragement. So many of us, the, the testimonies are, are neglected, unread, unappreciated, the counsels. God is not a God of waste. We see that. In Christ's feeding of the 12, what did he do? He gathered up all the fragments. We're not dealing with a God who says and does things just for the convenience of it. No, it's a purpose. Those testimonies are given us, whether from Sister White, whether later from Wagner and Jones, so that to help us on our Christian walk, to perfect our Christian character, because that's the only thing we can take with us. So I want to encourage all of us, read. Whether someone um, tells you something else, read. So that for yourself, 
you know what has been written. Any comments? What I'd like to say regarding remember your leaders. Point number one, we have to support them. We have to obey them. Basically, because God has elected them. They are God's appointed. Whether in the church or out of the church. Most of us work outside. We don't work for the church. But we have to work in such a way that we don't go opposite to their commands. We have to be examples of good workers. And then I like to give the example of David. Uh, David knew that King Saul had apostatized. David knew that. But when the time comes, David says, how can I lay my hand on the Lord's anointed? He supports him. He fights his battles. You know? So, supporting leaders. Thank you, Brother. Anyone else? Brother Mike? Yes, it's a good thing to support our leaders. Even Paul says that we should obey those in authority. But if our leaders are going contrary to what the Lord has established, I think it is right for us to disobey them. In the sense that God wants us to obey what he himself has asked us to do. He gives us instruction, follow them. Though most of the time the leaders, in quotes, are man-elected and then putting the stamp of God on them. Because when you see the process of the elections, I not generally say, yes, they are godly. Yes, God allows them to be where they are. And as such, we need to obey them. But when they start to make policies that are directly opposite to Thus says the Lord, I think it is right for us to take a stand for what is right. Thank you, Brother Mike. Anyone else? Go ahead, Sister Carol. Yes, actually, I, I was going to say somewhat like what Brother Mike said. Um, and we have to understand that leaders are men just like we are. You know, they, they have their tendencies also. But as like what Brother Mike said, um, even in the Bible it says, it, uh, I'm I'm paraphrasing maybe, to obey God rather than man. That's right. So if man is doing something that's not right, how do we actually obey them in that way? Thank you. Brother Satya? Yes, I just wanted to add, I mean, even in our denomination today, to obtain certain position has become very political. I mean, sad to say, you know, now right now the GC election is coming in June and there are already people line up, please vote for me. You know, and it is sometimes very obvious, but you know, again, when our leaders, GC meets, there are sincere Adventists who would spend hours before coming to the floor to vote for a leader. Yes, we have both and we have real godly leaders as well as those who are basically interested in certain portfolio. So, you know, we have to be careful and only thing we can do, we are not the delegates, Pray for those leaders for giving them wisdom so that they can elect the best God-fearing leader to lead our organization. Okay. How much do I have? Three minutes? Uh, one of the things I want to say, and um, I know what Brother Mike said and Brother Satya is saying, we have to remember that in Christ's time, who was it that led the people astray? It was the leaders that they were following. So when the leaders stood there and fought against Christ and fought against the light that Christ had brought, 
the, most of the people just followed Sui as well. And it is very important that those at the head of the organization that you pray for them. Because the, the, at the ho end of the day, your hope is that the guy who is most spiritual is the one who ends up with, I don't want to say the scepter, but in the leadership position. Because you have to remember that their leadership affects everything that trickles down from them. It's just like any organization. You go to work for some people and you realize the culture is so difficult, it's because those at the head, all it does, it, 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 it trickles down. So it, it becomes very important uh, that even as elections come up, I, I'm not sure, if, I guess that's the process they, they, that's done, that we remember those who are going to be elected. And we'll leave it at that. God help us all to remember also we have to give account for ourselves. So at the end of the day, we're not saved in batches or bunches, but we're saved as individuals. But the encouragement is that we have what? Brotherly love. So that even as we walk this way with our hope in the kingdom, that we encourage those who walk with us. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Amen.